So welcome, Douglas Adams, the creator of A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that uh, ran through Radio 4 all last week and who was supposed to be with us last Monday. We got a burst tyre or something. Uh, well, I parked on a nail, um, which is rather unfortunate. Um, the most unfortunate thing about it is this is a new car which I'd only had three days before and um, I discovered that if you get a puncture in this particular car, um, it costs you £200 because the oh. tyres... The <laughs> tyres cannot be repaired, they will not be guaranteed if they're repaired, and you actually have to buy a new tyre, and no one had told me that the cost of the tyres was almost £200. And I'm not going to ask you what sort of car it is, <laughs> but you know, a hitchhiker around the galaxy has got to be able to cope with things like that, surely? Um, yes. Um, I mean, the people I wrote about might have been able to cope with it, I wasn't. <laughs> this is the main thing about writing at this Look, point. tell me, you've got a cult here on your hand. Well, so people keep on telling me it's a cult programme, uh, and so on. What, what intrigues me is who the audience is. Are they sci-fi This intrigues us? me as well. Um, partly, yes. I think I, I, I've, I've inadvertently been terribly lucky in that I, I think the, 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 the sci-fi audience, uh, sorry, the SF audience, it's very wrong to say sci-fi, I'm told, uh, the SF audience uh, like it because it, it's science fiction, and the people who don't like science fiction like it because they think it's a parody of science fiction. <laughs> and not yet. So, uh, you know, I've just sort of got there in the middle so far. But you must be a science fiction person, uh, well, to an extent anyway, because you're also the editor of the Doctor Who script, aren't you? Yes, I edited the season which went out this, this, um, this winter, um, which was an unusually short season, unfortunately, because the, the BBC Sea Strike meant we had to ab abort the last six episodes halfway through making them, which is a, which is a shame. Mm. But do um, the two tie up? I mean, is there no, a similarity between them? No, there isn't. And in fact, it became very, very difficult actually working on both simultaneously because obviously there are superficial similarities and they're both um, science fiction adventures. Um, but it, it really meant that by the time, by the end of a day working on the one, it was impossible to turn one's attention to the other. Um, it was too close yet too far away. And I kept, when, I, when I knew I was embarking on both simultaneously, I thought, well, any ideas I get for one which don't quite work there, I can use in the other. And that didn't work at all. Mm. They are actually totally different. Am I right that uh, in this country, Doctor Who is a children's programme, but abroad it is an adult's programme? Well, um, in, in, in fact, in this country, it's, it's very, very broad, the audience, from about 5 through to 65. And in fact, we, 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 the, the interesting thing is... Um, that uh, a lot of people say, oh, the plots are getting too complicated. But you see, uh, children today have a far, far more sophisticated technological education than we ever did. Um, with the result, they actually understand it. We, have a, we had a saying in the production, which is that we must keep the, the plots complicated enough to keep the um, kids interested and simple enough for the adults to understand. <laughs> oh, I like it, yes. But when you take something like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I mean, okay, it is fun. Um, it is a fun series, it's a funny programme, but is there anything serious behind it? Um, behind the jokes there are more serious jokes, and behind those there are a lot less serious jokes. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking of that thing, that the mice experiment, for example, yes. when suddenly you find that it's not the mice who are being experimented on, it's actually the mice who are doing the experiment. Doing the experiment, yes. Well, in, in fact, curiously enough, I, I had a letter from a bloke who's actually involved in that sort of behavioural research, using mice and hamsters and so on, and getting them running up and down mazes and ringing bells and that sort of thing. And he said, um, he was astonished to hear this in this programme, because this is a, a paranoia which people working in that field uh, suffered from, that they were actually the subjects of the experiment rather than the instigators of it. Um, so I had accidentally sort of hit a nerve there, which I was quite pleased about. What an evil thought. You're a comedy writer. I mean, one hears about the sort of inspiration of comedy writers. Yeah. Are you the sort of person to whom things happen, which you can then make use of? Well, in a way, I, mean, I, I think things happen to everybody. If, if, you're, if you're actually in the business, then, uh, then you tend to notice them more because you've got to sort of mine it for material. Um, and I, I think it just is that, of uh, actually noticing it happening. I mean, there was one extraordinary thing once happened to me, um, which was in a, 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 on a train station. I'd arrived to catch a train on Cambridge Station, and uh, it was going to be late, and I discovered I was about 20 minutes too early. So I thought, well, I'll... Um, uh, I'll go and get a cup of coffee and picked up a, a newspaper from the uh, f from the stall to do the crossword, you see. And I went into the went into the buffet, one of those wonderful British Rail buffets, which are, I believe, even worse than uh, the BBC ones. Uh, no, 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 I'm not <laughs> talking about British Rail buffets. <laughs> and um, 
I bought a cup of coffee and one of the small packets of biscuits, you know, about sort of eight packets and a biscuit, and went and sat at a table. So there, uh, there on, the, on the table was uh, the, the paper, the packet of biscuits, and the cup of coffee. And there was a bloke sitting opposite me, perfectly ordinary sort of bloke in a sort of business suit and everything. And um, he had a cup of coffee as well. And I um, took a sip of coffee, started doing the crossword. And the bloke sitting opposite me leant across, picked up the packet of biscuits, opened it, and ate one. <laughs> no, it's not the sort of thing you feel you could... I mean, one, 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 one suddenly becomes overcome with British res reticence at this time, and you think, uh, well, you can't really make a fuss and sort of point out that, that biscuit cost me all of one pea or whatever it is. So I just sort of ignored it and sort of took a sip of coffee and took a biscuit myself, and our, our eyes met just for a moment, and we both sort of looked away in a slight embarrassment. And um, then he leant across picked out another packet from the, uh, the from uh, another biscuit from the packet and ate it. And having not said anything the first time, it was even more difficult to say anything the second sure. time, you see, so I just sort of ignored it and sort of stared at the crossword. And I leant and, 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 and uh, picked up another biscuit and ate it. And again, our eyes caught each other just for a moment and then we looked away. And we went on like this through the whole packet. Uh, and there were only eight, but it seemed like a lot more. <laughs> and eventually we got to the end of the packet. Uh, an incredible sort of tension building up over this table. So both he'd, and he got up and left. I breathed a sigh of relief. And a few minutes later, my train was announced. So I got up, finished my coffee, picked up the newspaper, and underneath the newspaper were my biscuits. Ah! Oh, lovely. Oh, that's smashy. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned Cambridge. You were an ex-footlighter, weren't you? That's right, one, yes. one of the gang. That's right, yeah. yes. Um, rather, rather more recent than... Um, than the, the famous people have come out of it. But you worked on things like, you know, the good, not goodies, but the uh, Life of Brian mob, all that sort of thing. Um, they yes, they well were your I, contemporaries. No, they're not my contemporaries. Oh, no, they're not, uh, no, they're they're about ten years older than me. <laughs> 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 no, I, I worked for a while with Graham Chapman of Python for, for about eighteen months on a, on a lot of projects. You didn't see the, see the light of day in the end. Um, then I was I was offered a, a job actually on Life of Brian. Um, but I think just the day before I'd signed a contract with the BBC to come be a producer for six, six months. And um, so I wasn't able to go and, and do And during that. that intervening period, were you not a bodyguard to That's an Arab right. royal? Or That's some right. Rubbish that was like after, that. I'd, after I'd um, finished working with Graham Chapman, and that hadn't really worked out terribly well. And um, so I was, I was suddenly at a totally loose end and didn't have any work and wasn't sure what to do. And suddenly discovered I had got uh, no money at all, or rather the, my bank was banking with me. Um, and so I, I somehow had to get some money to pay the rent. And just through an advertisement in the Evening Standard, I got this job as a, as a bodyguard for this Arab royal family. Is the right build for it? That's for sure. Well, in, in effect, I mean, that wasn't really the, the, the point of this year, because the company who were um, uh, employed to supply them had suddenly been allowed of this contract and, and just didn't have enough people, so they were practically pulling people in off the streets. Um, I mean, any side, I mean, provided they had the right number of legs and arms and, and a suit to wear, that was it. What did you have to do then? Well, basically, I had to sit outside their hotel room for 12 hours a night, from 8 o'clock till 8 o'clock, and there were various ancillary duties, like you had to wear a suit and stand up and sit down every now and then and open and close a few doors. And uh, that was it. I mean, it was really there as a, as a status symbol. I mean, if anybody comes along with a sort of gun or a grenade, you run away. I mean, it's quite <laughs> simple. Um, and, um, Did you have to do anything ever, or just sit there reading all the time? Oh, well, I just sat there reading, actually. Um, but uh, it was extraordinary seeing these people, because uh, there was the Altani family, who are the ruling family of Qatar, which is a very small Gulf state, but one of the richest. And, you see, a lot of the members of this family, and the, the, the ruling family, about 900 of them, uh, and they more or less are the country. I mean, no, nobody else counts, really. And the older members of them had sort of started out life owning two camels, one of which was lame, and now the entire family had an income of something like £20 million a day on which you can get by, believe me. <laughs> um, and uh, they, they, they somehow hadn't quite, uh, some of them hadn't quite come to terms with this yet. So, for instance, I remember one evening... Um, I better not start naming hotels, but they were, it was, they were very major London Park Lane hotels. And they went down to, about six of them went down to the um, restaurant in the Dorch, uh, in <laughs> one of these hotels. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the waiter brought the menu. And they looked at it and said, yes, please, we'll have it. 
the waiter sort of boggled a bit, realised they meant it for real. And I had to go away and bring the entire menu, which is actually Heck. thousands of pounds worth of food. And they brought it, and about six of them sitting there, and they tried a bit of this, tried a bit of that. Didn't like it too much, so they went back up to their room and sent out one of their servants to get a sack full of wimpies. <laughs> Nothing else you can add to that, really, is there? No. Mind you, they own the place anyway, don't they? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Douglas, thank you very much. We'll pause. We'll have a, a new release from uh, Cliff Richard. And uh, this is a Radio 2 recent release. It's called Carrie. It's an EMI single from Cliff Richard. That's his new one. It's called Carrie. The time is now 29 and a half minutes to 8. Douglas Adams, the creator of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is still with me. And you've got lots of spin-offs now, Douglas, haven't you? You had the book. I mean, that was the top of the bestsellers, that one. Yes, it still is. And you've got T-shirts? Well, T-shirts, I, I believe there are meant to be some coming. I, I, I'm, I've yet to see them, actually. Um, apparently there are going to be towels as well, but I've yet to see those. What is the significance? Tell me. Yes, I've heard about these towels. What's the significance of a towel to an intergalactic traveller? Well, I, I, I make the point in, in, in the show that a towel is the most useful thing a hitchhiker can have with him uh, travelling um, through the galaxy. Um, a, because it's useful in all sorts of extraordinary ways and all sorts of things you can do with it. Um, but also because it's such an unlikely thing um, to have with you. And if anybody picks you up and they want to know a bit about you, and if they think you are actually sufficiently organised to have your towel with you, then they think you must be... Um, you know, quite a well-organised person, <laughs> and you're all right. <laughs> it's a symbol of ordinariness, of good, solid, yes, sound right. common sense. Yeah. Where do you go from here? I mean, you've had the radio show. It then went into a stage show where you had That's the most right. extraordinary business of the audience being wheeled around. Ah, well, there are going to be even more extraordinary versions of that, actually, because in the original version of the ICA, we had the audience mounted on a hovercraft. Um, now, Ken Campbell, who uh, produced it, has been looking for all sorts of different ways of remounting it. It couldn't carry on the way it was, because although it was doing terribly well, um, most of our audience was having to be turned away because there wasn't room on the sure. hovercraft, mm. so it wasn't financially viable. Uh, we've been looking for a, a way of building a much bigger hovercraft, but we haven't found somewhere to put it. But there's now a possibility of um, mounting the audience on ghost trains, <laughs> uh, which is investigating... Um, what about television? Is it ever going to get to television? Oh, yes, yes. We're making the first programme in May and the rest of them in the autumn. It'll be a series of six, which my guess is will probably be going out, well, in about January next year. It's going to be very difficult, isn't it? Because you're oh, suddenly going to have to put form and right. shape and character. Well, I think, it's, I think it's very exciting, actually, because... Um, you see, there are all sorts of techniques, all sorts of wonderful special effects, uh, computer graphics, all this sort of thing, which at the moment are being, uh, if I can say something, actually being squandered on programmes like Top of the Pops, where I feel that they're being used really to sort of dress up the picture and disguise the fact that what's going on on the screen is in fact terribly boring. Mm. Um, and I think there are all sorts of ways of using these techniques actually as part of the means of telling the story. But as, as far as you're concerned personally, I mean, it must literally in the last couple of years have changed your life totally. Yes, I now have 200 pound punctures. <laughs> <laughs> and apart from the fact that you haven't got the money from your T-shirts, you're <laughs> making quite a, quite a tidy sum of money out of it. Um, yes, well, I, I seem to be continually overdrawn, actually, because I'm one of these people who, every time they know someone is coming in, go and spend it on Wednesday and then spend it again on Thursday. Um, I, I think it's partly because if you, if you ever actually had any money in the bank, you wouldn't actually do any writing. <laughs> <laughs> you could buy yourself two cars with 200 pound <laughs> tires. Douglas, thank you very much. I know it's set for a fantastic future, and I hope that uh, all lives up to your expectations. Thank, thank you very much, much indeed. <laughs> Finally, let us join our hero, Arthur Dent, and co, including their friendly, I think, computer, on one of the many moments of high drama from the series. Impact minus 25 seconds, guys. The rockets are still homing in. You can't shake them. We're going to die. When you walk through Shut the that storm. bloody computer up. Minus 15 seconds. Why doesn't anyone turn on those improbability drive thing? Don't be silly, you can't do that. Why not? There's nothing to lose at this stage. Does anyone know why Arthur can't turn on the improbability drive? Minus 5 seconds, we've got 